Welcome to Rising Tide Startups, where today's most exciting solopreneurs share their startup stories. They also deliver tangible strategies that they would implement personally if starting their business over today. Each episode is a startup masterclass. Make sure you take notes. Take it away, Kevin. This is Kevin Pro with another episode of Rising Tide Startups, and I have a special guest with me today, Rob Lachin. Rob, thanks for joining us on Rising Tide. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me. And uh, so please say your name just for the sake of, of accuracy, because <laughs> I'm sure I just butchered it. So tell them how you can okay, say that's name. Lachin. Lachin. Lawhen, yeah. We're, we're just gonna go with Rob for the rest of the rest that of the works. interview here, and we can just put the put the name in the credits. But Rob, I'd love you to share your a little bit of your story with our with our listeners. Uh, just a quick bio. Uh, everyone talks about the journey, right? Well, mine was yeah. a really long one because I started in the mountains of Vermont, you know, in a working class family. I didn't have Princeton and Harvard uh, parents. Mm. Um, and somehow I found my way to university in, in, in New York and at Albany, SUNY Albany, which is a great school. And, you know, 10, 12 years later, I'm negotiating a $3 billion deal and with the biggest banks in the world in the middle of Silicon Valley. Wow. Well, yeah, As that's one a, does from SUNY Albany. I you know, say, I mean, it's just a common, common <laughs> journey, right? <laughs> well, a lot of it, I think, is if you find yourself in a, you know, a, a lucky position of being in the right place at the right time, it's about... Uh, keeping your head clear and, you know, your nose to the grindstone and staying humble and just work your work hard. And, you know, when you have the chance, you got to go after it because we don't all get those chances. They are luck. Well, That's I'm, what you do when they arrive. I have no doubt about it. I'm, I'm curious to, uh, so, so take us to university. You graduated. I mean, you know, your background, business, marketing, economics, finance. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted, wanted to be, be a lawyer. So I had delusions of grandeur, not for money, but to make the world a better place. And at the time, because as you can see, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not a millennial. I missed that one a little <laughs> few years. We can't um, spell millennial. You know that. You you mean either one. I don't you know if I can. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but at the time, um, you know, the US was not in a good place. There was uh, a recession going on. No one had any money. It was a big problem. Interest rates were through the roof. Yeah. And there was this process of uh, all, uh, everyone was leaving all the cities and they were deteriorating. And uh, I wanted to become a lawyer, work in government and, and use technology like transportation because the U.S. is so abysmal and public transportation like train, right. subway sort of thing. And, and bring that in to reindustrialize, you know, the, the U.S. and bring people back to the cities and, you know, turn the U.S. back on. That was my so I went to school to be a lawyer. I did pre-law. Uh, political science. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I got accepted to law school, three of them. I won't tell you the one that said no. Um, <laughs> out by you. I wanted to go there really bad. Starts with a G. Like, <laughs> no. Uh, uh, so I went to work. So it was by accident. Um, I got a job at a technology company and that company went public. I actually made some money really young. And then next thing I know, I'm in another i moved to silicon valley and i competed against like 75 people i was told and i got the first sales job in a company called scopus mm. and scopus became siebel siebel sold to oracle for 90 billion wow i was employee number eight in the company uh so again right place right time worked hard did well Game and then games. i got the opportunity to run you know a company at least in the operations side in the uk i did my first road show at like 27 um with uh dmg deutsche bank and is this in work. london yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah it was a company called micromuse and it was a network monitoring tool that all the big telcos were using when they were trying to launch internet mm -hmm. uh you had to manage it so we uh i grew that company like 50 50 percent quarter over quarter went public in 14 months after we launched the product and then broke the uk record um, so that was a fun ride. And then I got to do my own, kind of, you know, did okay and had some money to invest in myself. So I started a company with three of my friends called Octane Software. And the whole idea was to take CRM, which I had learned mm -hmm. at Scopus and Siebel, uh, and put it on the internet. And it was a novel idea at that time. So we raised about $55 million. The company broke every record in Silicon Valley at the time, started in my basement. Um, and we uh true garage startup yeah yeah Basement we startup. Uh, 
yeah, to totally, it's one of those uh, uh, Cinderella stories. And we just worked really hard. None of us had any experience running a company where, you know, CEOs or whatever. So anyways, we, we, uh, we were in a quiet period and we were expected to be one of the largest IPOs of, of that, of the internet bubble. And the last and biggest deal of the internet bubble was our deal, Octane Software. It was a $3.2 billion transaction. And this was right before what, 2008, 2009? This was three days before the crash and it was the largest and biggest deal of the day for a startup in the world um, at the time. And it actually closed or how did, yeah. how did the, how did the uh, I guess, crash impact that, that deal? Um, the stock tanked. Uh, so uh, I won't even give you the number of how much my piece was worth. Mm. Uh, and, you know, it's, they're just numbers. They mean nothing. I never hit mm -hmm. the, I never hit the button that says spit out all the money at the bottom. Yeah. Um, the ATM. Um, but I did, I, I was able to architect, uh, what's called a collar. If you've ever heard of one of those, um, in, uh, on wall street where you, you leverage your stock so they can't. So once you give it to them and they hold it, it won't go below like maybe 10%, mm -hmm. but then it also has a ceiling and that's where they make their money on the arbitrage, right? Yeah. Um, so I actually did well. I was the only one that did that. So I, I got lucky and, and I, I did well, but the stock along with everyone else's uh, it, it tanked from like 280 down to like uh, $9 at one time. Mm -hmm. But I really wasn't affected because I had uh, secured mine with a, with a special instrument. Is that company still around or has it been absorbed or what? Uh, Epiphany bought it. They were worth about 10 billion. Uh, yeah, they sold to some other big company down the road. I can't remember which one it was. Epic Systems, maybe. I think it was Epic Systems. Um, and then after that, about two years after that, uh, I wanted to use the same playbook, if you will. And I thought the next big thing is going to be CRM on your phone. So I started a company called Dextera. Um, and we were the first, the biggest, had all the patents for downloading applications over the internet onto your phone. So the first time it was ever done was at Dextera. We were working with Microsoft and HP and Compaq and all the big companies were behind us. Uh, and I raised quite a bit of money for that company and it got hit by the next uh, downturn. Mm. So we talked about luck. Yeah. First one was lucky in the right place at the right time, highly overvalued. The second one, um, a better company, grew faster, had hundreds of big name customers around the world. The company was growing so fast, but when the uh, when the when the when the downturn hit in two thousand and eight on that one, um, I was on the wrong side of it, and we had to sell the company at a lesser you know value than it was. So right. I've seen. I guess what I'm saying is I've seen both the sure. ups and the downs, and I've been on both sides of them. And um, uh, yeah, those were the two big ones. And then, and then Ferret came along. Um, I actually started two companies at once. Um, I started Ferret with the whole idea of uh, bringing transparency. You know, we have the social media where we all see what each other are doing all day, but mm -hmm. it's all user generated. Even, I mean, if you look me up on, on LinkedIn, I mean, I wrote that. You, you don't know how, it's probably, you know, you'd think people embellish, right? Um, and, you know, they... They might say they're a VP instead of a director. Or they yeah. might say they're somewhere a little longer, or, and they're not going to write the you know the story of why they you know left the company. It's it's very user generated uh, advertising, if you will. So the whole idea was that um, you know like you and me before you met me, it would be effortless for you to see who I am, the good, bad, and the ugly. Like what's my story? That's the first thing you asked me. That is exactly what Ferret does. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the juicy part of Ferret is that you uncover skeletons in the closet that people don't tell you uh, that is, have made the news or they're in some government database that we've uh, acquired access to. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, all the data that we have is all publicly available and CCPA and GDPR compliant. Right. Right. I signed up three law firms to make sure we don't stray from that. I was gonna say that that's an expensive mistake. If, uh, if, if you're not it compliant, it can, it can be very expensive. Ask some of, the, some of the major companies that have paid large fines in Europe. Yeah. And, and, you know, we have, again, I'll go back to this delusions of grandeur that we're the good guys, you know, like we're, 
we're trying to bring a, a tool intelligence to us. I mean, the way I look at it is all the AI that we read about, it's usually deployed for the benefit of the company that's writing the software. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And our AI is for the benefit of us users, mm -hmm. basically doing matching and relevancy. It's actually quite boring. It's about matching things because it's so hard. The matching. Data analysts out there, data is not boring. They, 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 <laughs> yeah, for them, it's not. They, uh, the average the user data geeks out there, there, that's right. But you can imagine how hard it is to look at gazillions of records every day. I mean, we will have one of the largest databases about people in the world. Um, it's massive. So trying to find your Pat Smith and your contacts, you know, when, a, mm -hmm. when an article comes out or they may find themselves, you know, in a, in, in a news article or in a government um, uh, uh, um, uh, publication, uh, like a court record, if you will, or most wanted or Interpol, if it's really that sure. bad, bad. We have that too. Um, but I mean, it's a good point because like most wanted when you're on there, if you get on there and you're gone in two weeks because they took you off it, there's no history of that. Yep. So one of the things that we've done that makes us completely different than anything else that's out there is we've saved, we, I purchased the largest, the rights to the largest news database about people that's used by banks and governments in the world. I bought it. That was my big investment. Was bought buying the database or bought access to that? I bought the database. Wow. Um, yeah, because I happened to own, I was an investor in the company that built it for banks mm -hmm. and government. And they 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 built it to uh, satisfy compliance and banks. That's, mm -hmm. that's really boring too. Um, uh, uh, when you open a bank account, they have any money laundering compliance and that yeah. sort of thing. It was boring, you know, that's what that company did, but it did really well. And I did well, because I was the biggest investor in that company and they wanted to sell it. And, and I woke up the next day and I called the CEO, who's was a good friend of mine. And I said, uh, uh -uh. I'm gonna buy it and we're gonna democratize that data that's used in the ivory tower because we have no control. You're not gonna bank and they say, you're not, you can't open a bank account for whatever, we never know why. It's all behind the purple curtain, yep. you don't know yep. why. No, you, know, you can't look at my monitor. <laughs> no, none of that so my whole idea was well why don't we just take that data and democratize it for all of us so that we can use it and build around that data set you know with all the other data sets that we've got so that we can see the essence of a person you know what's their story and then if something happens have it effort effortlessly tell you that one of your contacts is in the news or mm -hmm. started a company or sold a company or you know, God forbid, uh, got themselves in some hot water and some trouble and you'd never know. And by the way, they could have gotten in trouble in Zimbabwe. Well, no. I mean, right? you, you kind of, you, you didn't uh, let's say you're brushing by this for whatever, but you, you kind of, you know, painted the picture like, well, I was working there and this company was going to be for sale and I saw some value there. And so I decided to buy it, but it's, it's interesting. I'm just, I, I told you, I was listening to another interview you had done about, and you talked about um, some of the, uh, dangers of, of, of like venture capital and angel oh, investing, God, yes. and you're like yeah. going, yep. you know, I, who do you get in bed with here? It's I'm trying know, to suppress it's, that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to suppress you that. To back bring up head. those bad thoughts. But I mean, you had a personal interest oh, in one. this as well. Big one, big one. Um, yeah. Without mentioning any names, but it's in ferret. <laughs> I checked. Um, I, I, I can't name the financial institution, but it's in one financial tower in New York, and it's one of the biggest ones in the world. And I got introduced to an investor in that tower and they invested in my company and a bunch of others. They were a new firm. And their whole idea was once the company started taking off, they had some clauses in the contract that we didn't catch. And they had a ability to take over the company off notes. Wow. And it was just a new, you know, a, 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 you know, a new thing, a, a new scam. And there were two or three before me. Hmm. So if I had ferret, you know, so like everyone has a story. I know you have. I mean, we all have stories where you got to yep. advantage yep. of. Yeah. If I had seen that, if it was Certainly on ferret, not at that level, I can assure you. <laughs> yeah, I lost a lot of money personally on that one. So yeah, I mean, part of the reason I called Al, the CEO of of this company, back and said we're going to take it because I it immediately hit me. If I had it, not the banks, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have happened to me. So yeah, I have um, I have my own stars that drive me every day, which takes me to another part of the story that 
um, it seems to be really in today and, and, and uh, it's more where I am in my life right now. I've already had my, you know, my, my lucky 15 minutes of fame when I was younger and now it's about legacy, mm-hmm. you know, and ferret. I know there's a lot of people that have gotten in trouble. There's people that got hurt. Imagine dating sites. You don't know who you're. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they're so dangerous, right? Yeah. I actually want to give some of our data to them for free. Just so they don't have any money, the users can at least keep the worst of the, you know, the people out of their house, if you will. But so the whole idea was what, if Ferret gets scale, and by the way, there's a free version. Mm-hmm. You can only use it like the New York Times 10 times a month, then you got to pay if you want to use it more. But it tracks your contacts and every or anybody you put in. So if you're on a date, you just pop the name in, even if they're not in your contacts. And it'll tell you what their background is. And maybe you're dating and uh, someone that just sold their company for $40 million and they're successful and they have a background like you where um, they're, they're out making the world a better place. And you're like, score, right? But, or you could find out that in London, they're in New York, but they got you know a, a battery charge in London. That would never come up in a background check. In or maybe they took a detour to an island. <laughs> the yes exactly <laughs> yes exactly and by the way that is in ferret mm. 2008 or 2009 jeffrey epstein got arrested in florida so it might you know it might make you think twice about getting on his plane if you is had primarily ferret. public access i mean public domain it's data it's all public but try i, I Try to go get it yourself. You got to oh, go. No, no, it. yeah. I, there was no implication. Awesome. I can just Google this. And why do I need Ferret? I got Google. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, yeah. It's I'm not on Google. If it's like a private mm-hmm. database or it's like truly, I mean, it's a whole bunch of scraping all kinds of. We're scraping all yeah. kinds of databases. So, I mean, this is really boring, but think about, you know, my name. You asked my name, Robert Lawhen, but I'm actually, some people know me as Rob. Some people in my family know me as Robbie. Mm. Some of the older people in the family call me Bobby mm-hmm. and Robert and I'm actually Robert Michael. I'm wow. actually Robert Michael Lawhen the third. Mm. So you can see, like, if you're just doing a regular search on Google, yeah. First of all, data even was there, which it's not. They don't track this kind of data. It's it, 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 it. We even have a database that's called the Name Reconciliation Database. That when you put your name in, it takes every single variation and goes and hits all the databases. But there's there's so many databases from all over the world. I don't have them all yet. I've done we've done the U.S. and India. So we have really good full coverage there. Mm-hmm. Um, we did a deal with uh, uh, a large Silicon Valley based news organization where we publish all the good news about people in Silicon Valley that you know got promotions, new jobs. You know, it's one of the magazines that you know the name of really right. well. Right. Again, it's all about painting the whole picture, good, bad, and hopefully not ugly about who someone is mm-hmm. and alerting you. Because how do we keep track? I have 7,000 contacts yep. in my phone. Yep. You know, some of them I don't care about. So I'll turn them off. Is the know? database getting smarter? Is it? Is it like, yeah. I mean, yeah. where does AI come into? That's the cool part. The database, yeah. Yeah, the, the matching part, boring. Okay, it can match names, but it's still hard, right? Um, the cool part of the, of, of the AI, and I got the idea from Waze, is that um, as news comes out and it's fresh, you don't know if it's your Pat Smith. I mean, first of all, you don't know if Pat Smith's a, a man or a woman, right? Mm-hmm. You don't know. It could be either. Uh, there's so many. It's such a common name. So when something comes up and you're doing that, that matching algorithm, which I, I, I said is boring, there's another algorithm that sits on top of that and it goes out into the whole ferret community without sharing any data that it shouldn't. And it says, it picks like, you know, 10, 20 people, depending upon the age of the article and it'll, uh, of the, the person that's in there that's tracking. And let's say you and I have the same Pat Smith, you may not get to it, but it comes to me. And if I validate that's the right Pat Smith, because it wow, pulls wow. attributes out of the article, you know, like what their age is, you know, uh, where they live, where they work, you know, all the things that, that define a person. And you're going to go, yeah, that's my past myth. Click. Just like waves. There's a cop up ahead or there's a speed trap up ahead. If one person says it, they don't even put it up there. They wait till a number of people have. Mm-hmm. So I, I went to the people that it's are. Crowdsourced. You know, yeah, it's crowdsourced. So I went to the, you know, the team that's way smarter than me that actually write the code for this. And I go, can you do this? Like we did in ways where the community is helping us uh, 
uh, validate data. So no fake news, right? <laughs> they said, can that's, we do that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's the- Give us a tough company. challenge. <laughs> it's a new company. So, you, you know, you do as best you can in the beginning and you just keep making it better and better and better. But it is community validated data which is pretty cool, I think. That is the cool part. And I, I, I mean, it just makes the information more accurate. It makes it more reliable yeah, trust and trustworthy. About yeah. trust at yeah. the end of the day. Like when you, at least in Ferret, you can trust that it's a machine that's been told that you go into Google and you do a search on a person. The first thing that comes up is LinkedIn. Why? Because LinkedIn's paid Google a ton of money to make sure that they're high up in the SEO. Mm -hmm. There's no SEO in Ferret. It's weighted by keywords that define the actions and the relevancy to you um, when it sorts it all out. So it, it's hard, man. Outside the software we built, we were told there's nothing more cutting edge than what we've accomplished so far. I mean, I'll say one other thing. I can't tell you the name of the company again, but the company that hosts our software, um, their CEO, and these are big companies that we all know, they only bring five companies to the table a month to talk about, and Ferret was one of them. When it when they're looking at trends and what to look for, this is there's a lot of interest in Ferret as you can. Who wouldn't want it if it's free, right? Well, and I mean, free or not, I mean, absolutely. If it's going to save you time, it's going to save you money. It's going to save you the embarrassment of of you know going back even if you can afford to lose you, you're there's just this whole idea of you know shock and awe that said i should have known this I, if i'd have had this i would have known this before i made that bad exactly decision. If, if i only knew right? right and and you know there's more boring applications that are just practical like i'm going to hire a new plumber to come over well i can tell you if that plumber has been sued five times yeah getting a new doctor don't you want to know what their scorecard is your lawyer you know, all of that, all those databases, I have those too in Ferret. So it's more about, um, it's just a, it's just bringing who they are and what they've done out to make it transparent. And once we all, I'm on, I'm on this very large podcast uh, in about two weeks, 100 million downloads. I'm scared, actually. Uh, <laughs> I've never done anything that big. And uh, the gentleman that runs the show, uh, I think it's the biggest one on on Apple. They, he he said, Rob, there. Uh, he said, Rob, there's seven year olds out there right now that won't know what the world was like before there was ferret. Mm -hmm. Because when there's ferret, you just see everything. You know, you just see everything about anybody. Um, and one of the other delusions of grandeur is that someday this will be in your glasses. And by the way, if you're in the metaverse, who do you know? How do you yep. know who you're dealing with? Yep. Because it's an avatar. They, they, it, it's the epitome of user-generated content. So, so what's the ultimate, I mean, what's the, what's the next projection in your mind? So you're, you know, people can envision what LinkedIn looks like. I mean, yeah. so what is, what is the public interface of Ferret look like, if, especially with like a freemium model where you're, you know, I'm assuming part of that is designed to, to really build a, an audience or to, to build a, yeah. you know, more people in the, in the, you totally the users, nailed whatever the, the, the way we built it, the more people that use it, the better it gets just like ways mm -hmm. um, is one of the examples I use. So uh, the whole idea is that it just runs in the phone in your background. You don't have to think about it anymore. It's just looking at your contacts and telling you when there's news on your con. Think how much time, I don't know about you. I spend a lot of time just reading news every day. I wish I could yeah. unplug, but there's nowhere to go see where the news is about your contacts. Just that alone, that one slice. I mean, you can go to Google and type, you know, Rob Lawhan, put it in parentheses and hit save. And if anything comes up with Rob Lawhan in it, it'll come back to you. But what if it was Pat Smith? Mm -hmm. Yeah, There's not many Rob Lawhans. It's a little easier, a little easier uh, but, to find Rob than Pat, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like that on steroids for all of your contacts that you choose. You can, de, you know, you can deselect whoever you want. Are there um, filters? Like if I'm looking for Pat Smith, do I say Pat Smith in Detroit? That is between this, this age that is male or female. That is, I mean, how, how am I searching in? in okay. You're not doing any of that. It's doing it for you. So it'll actually, if an article comes up, that's a candidate that's, it looks like it is your Pat Smith. Mm -hmm. It'll ask you and those other tw first 20 
uh, people that it thinks are the closest to that person. It'll ask them, is this your Pat Smith with those attributes that I mentioned that it pulls out? It'll say in the article, it says Pat Smith lives in New York, is 57 years old, works at IBM and, you know, uh, uh, whatever other attribute it is, right? And you go, yeah, that's totally my Pat Smith. So you'll click, that's my Pat Smith. And then the other 19 click, yep, that's my Pat Smith. Or some of them say no. Uh, the system's done. It asks. It has bots that ask you those questions before it shows you the articles. No, I'm That's like. A, let's say I'm looking. I, I'm. You're an investor. Your your yeah. name is Pat Smith. I'm. I'm yeah. going to go meet with you in this tower in New York. How yeah. do I using Ferret? How do I find Pat Smith? I don't have an article or anything. How do I find information about Pat Smith? Oh, you just type. You type Pat Smith's name in. You do nothing but type Pat Smith's name in it. Because there's a good chance, like I said, the more people use it, the smarter the system is, that Pat Smith with that email and or phone number, which are unique identifiers, right, are in there. Okay. We don't see the data. We don't ever see your data. No one else ever sees your data, but that AI relevancy and matching engines running around in the background going, hey, that Pat Smith, you know, in Kevin's contacts, it has the same phone number and emails as the Pat Smith and Rob's. Rob's already been collecting and watching Pat, this Pat Smith, you know, for three weeks. We're pretty sure this is Kevin's Pat Smith too. Pop it out to him. So that's what's going on. It's primarily a news aggregator. Yeah, it's a news aggregator, but it's not just news sources like the New York Times and the India Times. No, no, no. Yeah. I'm talking about just just, uh, media information related to a contact. It's not necessarily... I, I need to know Rob's email address. So I'm going to type in his name and get his email address out of there. It's not no. that type of. We will not do that. Of, we will not share any of your contact data with anyone else. It, people get scared about AI and you know how it's used. I don't blame them. I'm scared too as a consumer. We only use it for matching and relevancy. We don't even see it. We don't see, like if I'm in your contacts, no one, no one inside our company or anybody else using the app ever can see your your contacts nothing so how do you how do you make the information better so like let's say somebody writes a nefarious article about me as an investor and Mm -hmm. that's that's the thing that pops up every time people look in ferret under my name and it's absolutely false how do you how do you you know how do you clean Uh, or do or can you clean the information right now we can't clean it all we can do is make sure we choose the right data sources mm. so That's you know when you're in the yeah. line at the grocery store and you got all those ones on the side with you know all the yeah yeah not those <laughs> those are not the ones we're using That's right. Right. <laughs> and then government hey who, of course you can trust the government right <laughs> but at least you know it's real real information that's in there right but i mean we like we have data about what companies you are in like we mentioned that you you know you're in a, a non-profit that does mm-hmm. great things i would have already known that you wouldn't have had to tell me when we met and yeah. i would be Kevin's a cool guy. He's doing great things. Um, I want to know him, right? Because uh, it just comes up. It'll just be there because you're you're registered in that company. Right. So, and right. that maybe that you had a company five years ago and it went belly up and you don't tell me, but well, I'm going to know about that one too. Yep. Yep. It so gives you, you see, balance. I mean, it really does. It's, yeah. Not, I mean, people rarely have either all bad news or all good news. I mean, no. there's, there's generally a balance, but it, it's, it gives you a comprehensive picture. Of we put it in really buckets. Kind of- and okay. one thing we never do is we never judge. We're not judgy. So we're just, you nailed it. We're aggregators and, you know, we, we, we um, compile the, you know, the, the information for you on your contacts, but we don't um, judge if it's good, if they're good or bad. We don't give them a score or anything right. like that. Your That's, agnostic uh, ag- aggregators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all about democratizing that data so we all can use it to make decisions every day. It's just that simple. That's the business model. I don't know of anyone, I've not met anyone that's, I always start by saying, if it was free, would you want to know about all the news mm. about everyone in your contacts when it happens? Yeah. Or something you're about to go meet or hire, you know, to do work at your house um, or for your business. But you cannot use it for hiring, by the way. There's laws against that. So tell me the, what, you know, if, I I mean, there's so many thoughts and gears running them in my mind right now that as I'm thinking about just kind of the business model, I would think there would be so many um, like joint venture applications. Oh, so many. As well. So 
What are I've what done. are some of the the crazier ideas that that have run through your mind? Oh, we already have. There's five of those waiting for us to deliver that the app right now. Two of them have over 50 million users. Hmm. One of them is a marriage site. Yep. So think about it. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the kind of just the, the safety in, in dating sites. You know, you mentioned yeah. that earlier in the podcast. I mean, just, there's dating, yeah. which is what am I going to do tonight? Mm -hmm. And then there's marriage sites of who am I going to spend the rest of my life right. with? You're marrying the family, right? Not just the person. Yep. So they want to use it to help people do due diligence on the person and the family that they're connecting with. Because so many people connect online now to get married eventually. Yep. yep. Um, you know, even through the dating sites. So the dating mm -hmm. sites. Yeah, so now we've got, um, I mean, if we don't, if we do this right and the, and the app performs well, there, I believe there's records to be broken with this, with this, uh, with this app. I, I've seen that before and been lucky enough to be in it. Um, but yeah, we have, we have, we have four or five papered up already that want to, to as you said, joint venture, they want to connect it into their into their back end and offer mm -hmm. it as a service. Yep. And they get a new uh, line on their balance sheet of revenue and profit that they didn't have before because they're offering and we share the revenue. Or it just strengthens their offering, just strengthens their product. It makes it a better, I mean, more robust, whatever that, you know, offering they're making. I mean, whether you, if you're white labeling on the back end or whatever, I mean, you just see so many, so many applications, but. But imagine you, know, you got 50 million people, they're using a dating site. It's one of the biggest ones in the world. We have two yeah. of those sites that are waiting for it. Uh, and we never, you know, we didn't, that's not where we wanted to go. We wanted to go to the, the investment community, which there's 12 million of them in the US. Yeah. Um, and then this one popped up and then another one, another one, another one. But if it were free and it was part of the app, you don't have to pay anything and you're doing searching on who you're gonna marry, and their family, how many of those 50 million people would not use that service? Mm. That's the question. Yeah. So let's yeah. say we charge one dollar a month. <laughs> yep. Yep. Or it's just added into the cost. You know, just added into the cost. Yeah. Yeah. So. And they're yeah, absolutely. I can I can see that that is truly the uh the beautiful passive income model of it's so of awesome. Their, I so. love SaaS because yeah. you know I'm one of the first SaaS companies. I'm old now, but it's so exciting. Hey, careful like, now. You said we were the same age. Sorry. You, know, you just <laughs> dragged me in the in the mud. There. <laughs> yeah, that was right. before you turned Which the camera. Which is so true. That's right. <laughs> so very true. That's exactly right. Yeah. Oh, man, I am. I uh, I love the story, and I I it's going to be really interesting to see kind of the trajectory of that that Ferret takes in the next few years, and and um, just as it as it comes to the forefront, and and even news is generated about Ferret that you know we're going to hear yeah. you know more and more, but. I, you know, I'd really love to dr just drill down to the founder side and just say, sure, sure. you know, if, if you're talking to people that are kind of behind you in the journey, you mm -hmm. know, I, this is kind of my favorite part of the interview, this, this mentor moment, you know, that we have yeah. at the end here, what, just give us a couple of just really solid, you know, pieces of advice that, you know, you wish you would have known, you know, oh, three long. startups ago, two startups ago, whatever, that would have been a game changer for you today. Just just yeah. two things that are kind of universal appeal, two regardless things. of the size. Yeah. The number one thing that kills companies is they run out of money. Mm. Number two thing that kills companies is they become defocused. If you want number three, four, and five, I got those two, been there, done it. Right. Uh, but those are the two biggest things. You run out of money and you, you get defocused. And by the way, if you get defocused, you run out of money. Um, and, you know, God forbid that the, a big customer comes along and they're not in your core vision, but you want that quick win and the shot in the arm, you go take that shot in the arm and you spend all your time and money on that one customer. And then you got a product that doesn't work for your core marketplace. Mm. That's why one in 40 companies in Silicon Valley actually be, something becomes of you know, good becomes of them. Right. So, so watch the money like it's your own. Uh, number one, stay very, very focused and don't let anybody talk you off your vision. Um, if you know in your heart and your mind and your, in your gut that people will want it because there's not always a straight line. If you're doing something no one's ever done before. I was going to say, is there ever a straight line? I mean, you know, it's certainly no. not. A, yeah, it's, I can see that just, there's a little bit of serpentine that happens in, in all of the journeys, but 
I, yeah, yeah I've heard that so often of just kind of, you know, stay in your lane, stay, stay focused. In the lane. Yeah. Um, you know, don't, I don't. I am a mentor in my own company. Yeah. And by the way, th there's a 27 year old, I almost said kid in, in our company. Uh, I wish I was as smart as he was, as, as he is when I was his age. And he's teaching me, he's mentoring me on things that I don't know much about in, you know, his world. Because they, that age group looks at uh, value very different than we, we yeah. may. Oh, for sure. Our age, our age group. So all yeah. Other. Yeah. So you have to be humble and be open and transparent about what you, you know, you got to be acutely aware of what you don't know and not be afraid to let those around you, no matter how much experience they have. I can tell you some of the best ideas I've ever implemented came from the QA team or, you know, the technical, there's a kid that is two years out of school, has a completely different view, knocks on your door and said, hey, what if you did this and that and the other, wouldn't it work better? And you're like, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of mentoring, but I'd say it's more like it, it's, it's, it's an inner, it, it's a communication and interaction. It's culture, Kevin, actually. Yeah. The culture yeah. that you have to create early. So that's number three. I mean, it's yeah. not just being a lifelong learner. It's, it's creating a culture of, of lifelong learning that it's, and it's collaboration. It's collaborative learning amongst, you know, those that have areas of expertise that you, we can learn from anybody. And you have to create a culture where people aren't afraid to fail, mm -hmm. not fail like ultimately. Right. You should be afraid of that. Yeah. But along the way, I mean, you know what they say: the road to success is paved with failures. Mm -hmm. You just hope they're small and not expensive. Yeah. Um, but if you people are more willing to, you know, create and reach and be innovative and try new things, if they know they're not going to be punished for for trying. So that's a big part of the culture I try to build. And, uh, and you're failing, you're probably not trying, right? Exactly. And then the old I'm school hard enough. Yeah. is you had a guy like me that starts a company and everybody works for him or her. And the companies that I'm running, because I've learned a lot, uh, you know, in my, my time too, is service based. Mm -hmm. My job is to provide a vision, hire the right people, the right team, to try to create that magic, give them the tools they need, Resource get the heck out of their way, yep. but they're doing their job yep. and be there as a service to them to make sure they have what they need to succeed. So it's a very different. Uh, approach than the old school hierarchical uh, organization. Right. right. Well, it's it's amazing. I mean, there's uh, there's not too many of us dinosaurs that can adapt. You know, so it's uh, it's amazing to see that you you can and and have. You obviously <laughs> have one more in me, right? <laughs> That's right. We got one more adaptation in us. So yeah. Hey, Rob, thank you so much for just taking time tonight, just sharing the story of Ferret and, and your personal kind of journey and things you've learned along the way, and it's just been a real pleasure to to uh, to meet you and to, to get a chance to kind of kind of pick your brain and, and listen to your heart a little bit about, you know, the things that are important and really just playing your part in helping all boats rise in a rising tide. Rob, have a great weekend. Thanks, Kevin. It was a pleasure meeting you too. Another episode in the books. We hope you heard some great takeaways. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review on iTunes and YouTube. As always, thanks for listening to Rising Tide.